the hell is going on? What's really going on? We said, what the hell happened? You don't have to know what the hell is on it. They, they see what's going on. I don't know what's going on. What is going on? We must find out what is going on. Hi, I'm Danielle Platka. I'm Mark Thiessen. Welcome to our podcast, What the Hell is Going On? Mark, what the hell is going on? Well, what the hell is going on first is we're going on hiatus. It is August, it is hot, and uh, it is time for a little bit of a break. We've been doing a lot of podcasts uh, in the past few weeks. We've even doubled up for a while for twice a week. So we hope you don't mind if we take a little bit of time off in August, but we'll be back. Uh, in September to cover all the vital events leading up to the most important election in American history. (laughs) And that is probably true no matter what your view on the election is, uh, whether you're for or against the president. And two, we have a really, really exciting podcast for you right now because we have somebody who doesn't do a lot of podcasts, doesn't do a lot of interviews, period. His name is Dr. Mansaf Slawi, and he is running Operation Warp Speed, which is the effort that President Trump launched in May 15th, 2020, to get a vaccine for the coronavirus in record time, and it is moving at warp speed. We may have a a vaccine passing phase three clinical trials by October, November, December of this year, which would be the fastest that a vaccine has ever been developed in human history. And we got the guy who's leading the effort uh, to talk to us today. No, it's a great get. He was really, really frank. He was very generous with his time. So Mark and I are going to keep our our intro a little brief today uh, so that you can listen to him. But this is what's on everybody's minds. Look, I mean, you know, Mark, you've been writing about this. For those of us who have kids, you know, Kids were in school, now they're not gonna be in school. For those of us who are involved with universities, kids were gonna be at university, now they're not going to be at university. We are just being whipsawed left, right, and center, and the politics around it is just disgusting. Yes, I agree. Uh, The politics is disgusting, it's all about blame game, it's not about the country pulling together, but you know, the reality is our lives have been upended like nothing that's ever happened before. You know, we can't, uh, my mom had COVID and she was in the hospital and then a rehabilitation center. I couldn't visit her for three months. I couldn't see her. Uh, You've had people who had their their parents and grandparents died. They couldn't even be with them uh, when they passed away. You've got uh, kids who uh, were pulled out of school, parents who can't go to work, tens of millions of people lost their jobs. And the amazing thing is that by this time next year, that could all be a distant memory. We could be at a situation where the most vulnerable people to this virus have been immunized, largely immunized from it. We will no longer be running around wearing masks everywhere. We will no longer have to social distance as strictly as we are today. Schools will be open. Nursing homes will be open. uh, Business will be humming. And it's because of Operation Warp Speed, if that happens. It's really been an unprecedented effort. And you're right. I mean, you know, we we all came together in the beginning and our politicians behaved with some self-control. And now it's all about figuring out who can screw who faster (laughs) and not in a good way. (laughs) No, you're right, Danny. The, uh, you know, and here's the thing that you get the sense that there are some people in this country who are really worried that we might get a vaccine before October uh, because they don't want Donald Trump to be able to go into the, into the Rose Garden and announce two weeks or three weeks before the election, ladies and gentlemen, my fellow Americans, we did it. We beat the China virus. We've got a vaccine that is proving effective and safe, and we've launched a massive effort to mass produce this vaccine and logistical effort to distribute it. And by January, February, all the vulnerable people in this country are gonna be getting a chance to immunize themselves because there are people in this country who care more about defeating Donald Trump than they care about the virus. They care more about it than they don't wanna get a, a corona relief bill because it would might help Donald Trump. We should all be hoping to get this vaccine as fast as possible, regardless of how it's going to affect the November elections. 
No, I mean, I completely agree. Now, I, I will say this, Donald Trump, as is his usual one, doesn't ever make things better on Twitter or anywhere else. And I will add that those who have suspicions that there is some political aspect to this are often encouraged by the way that he approaches this. But I think that what they forget is that while Donald Trump may have predilections that drive us all crazy, make us suspicious, make us hate him, you know, make us vote one way or another in November. The people around him are people with integrity, particularly the people who are working on a solution to this virus, people who are working on vaccines. These are not people who joined because they're Republicans or because they're Democrats. They're people who joined up, who gave up in many cases, very successful careers and are trying to do something for the good of our country. And to suggest that somehow Everybody around Donald Trump is besmirched by or infected by, to use the, the theme of the moment. His attitude towards things, I think, is terribly unjust. And that's where, for example, this gross, you know, playing with Dr. Fauci on the one hand by the, the president and playing with Dr. Birx on the other hand by Speaker Pelosi just seems to me to be the most unacceptable, juvenile way of approaching a national crisis. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And also the politicization of the uh, of the resurgence of the virus. There was a big story, I can't remember if it was the Washington Post or the New York Times the other day, this weekend, about how San Francisco, despite having done everything right, there's a huge surge of virus in San Francisco area. And everybody wants to blame the fact that they, oh, well, we reopened too quickly. And so therefore we brought back the virus. But then we're finding out that countries, you know, we've had podcasts talking about how well Taiwan did and how some of these South Asian countries did. They're now, many of them experiencing a resurgence of virus, a countries that did everything right. It's all politicized. It's all about, you know, well, we got to find a way to blame Trump for the resurgence of the virus. And here's the irony, Danny, and I'm going to do a column on this that the resurgence of the virus, which everyone's blaming Trump for, could actually be what makes it possible to get the vaccine done by October. The Wall Street Journal had a fascinating article the other day that says basically the problem with a lot of vaccine development is that the, vir the pandemic abates before you can test a vaccine and you don't have enough test cases. If you're going to test a vaccine, what you do is you put people in an area where there's an outbreak and you give some people the vaccine and some people not and see who whether it protects those people. And so it's actually the fact that we have outbreaks in Texas and Florida and other states that are allowing the pharmaceutical uh, companies to surge testing areas into those areas. And we may get the answer faster because of the resurgence of the virus. So I'm not going to celebrate the virus's resurgence. I have to say, you know, look, just looking at what's happening in my in my native land uh, of Australia, you know, this is it's been devastating. And they, of course, have had a minuscule number of deaths compared to to our own. You know, what you're talking about, Mark, though, is is this desire to somehow suggest that, you know, red states are uh, more deserving of the outbreaks resurgence than the beautiful people of San Francisco or Manhattan. And that's utterly repulsive. And, you know, the virus is going to come back and slap all these people in the face and make fools of them, frankly. There's nothing we can do about that. That's the point that we've sunk to in our politics at this moment. All we can do is try to share actual information with people. Well, that's what we've got, we're going to do today, because we've got somebody who is a, uh, has not a political bone in his body when it comes to this. He is a, is a accomplished scientist who's been behind the, uh, the development of more than a dozen vaccines that have probably changed your life and you don't even know it. And he's leading this effort and he's joining us today. Dr. Monsef Slau is our guest. He's the chief advisor to Operation Warp Speed. And I, I'm not going to read his entire bio because it would take the entire rest of the podcast, but he spent 30 years at GlaxoSmithKline. He's been a vaccine innovator. He was honored as one of Fortune's 50 greatest world leaders for his work in under-researched diseases common in the developing world. He's really... First of all, let me just say, having spent a little time with him, a very little time with him, he seems like an amazing person. The Trump administration and our nation were so lucky to get him. You're going to love our conversation. Well, Dr. Slawi, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Well, good. So you are leading an effort called Operation Warp Speed, which is designed to give us a vaccine for the uh, COVID-19 uh, virus in record time. Tell us about Operation Warp Speed and what the goals are. 
Operation Warp Speed actually is, is really aimed at accelerating development of vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics to help control this pandemic. And it's a partnership between various uh, institutes within the Human and Health Services, NIH, BARDA, the CDC, CMS, and with also the Department of Defense, and a number of private uh, companies that are the sponsors of vaccine programs or therapeutic medicine programs. And uh, the objective is really to significantly enable uh, acceleration of the, the program. So it's not about discovering a vaccine, but it's about selecting candidate vaccine, if I focus now the conversation around vaccines, and enabling, accelerating their preclinical development in animal studies and, and in tubes, uh, accelerating their development in clinical trials, accelerating the uh, setup of their manufacturing processes, build up of the manufacturing facilities or their refurbishing, and then the manufacturing and stockpiling of vaccine doses, and also prepare by integrating all the information generated through these processes for the companies to file uh, PLAs for approval with the FDA, which will independently review, of course, the performance of, of these vaccines from all standpoints, uh, and either issue an emergency use authorization, depending on data and how quickly they are available, or, or uh, a BLA uh, formal approval. And then the operation is also working closely with the CDC to discuss the uh, allocation of vaccine doses to various subpopulations at risk of uh, acquiring the COVID infection, uh, and also to study the what's called the pharmacovigilance to study the safety of these vaccines beyond the clinical trials in which they are currently tested. Dr. Slawi, in the military, they always uh, prioritize BLUF, bottom line up front. So let me ask you a bottom line up front question. How optimistic are you uh, about being able to deliver a usable vaccine to the American public by the end of the year? I am frankly very optimistic based on what we see in animal models with the current vaccines, based on, I would say, the natural history of uh, infection with the uh, uh, coronavirus, SARS-2 virus, in that the majority of people are able actually to control this infection uh, and are either asymptomatic or recover from their infection. I am optimistic because I think this is virus that if you are equipped with a little bit of immunity against it, that gives you an advantage of speed of your immune response countering the virus before too much of the virus has multiplied inside your body, then you avoid the fact that when your immune response finally mounts a little bit later than usual in, in a diseased patient, what happens is they get the virus, the virus multiplies too fast and too much before their immune response comes to destroy the virus, but then it destroys the virus and the body at the same time. And that's really most of what the early clinical disease is. So if we accelerate the immune response, uh, we will be able to, um, to have a vaccine. And the vaccines that are in development achieve that with two mechanisms. One, we make antibodies that neutralize the virus. So a good fraction of the virus that people receive when they are exposed to somebody who's infected will be immediately eliminated with those antibodies. And the second arm of the immune system that's being stimulated with these vaccines is what's called the, the cellular response of T leukocytes. You can hear about them now even in uh, news where those cells are endowed with the capacity to eliminate the cells that are already infected with the virus and kill the virus inside them and kill those cells at the same time. If there are only a few of them that are infected, you do that and you don't feel it or you have a little sneeze or a little cough or a little mucus and that's the end of it. And I, I am optimistic, too, very optimistic that we will have a vaccine that's protective and just based, unfortunately, on the current levels of transmission uh, of coronavirus that's happening in the U.S., I think the clinical trials will allow us to demonstrate efficacy before the end of the year. Talk a little bit about that because the Wall Street Journal just had a story uh, saying that re until recently, researchers thought it would take many months to get enough COVID cases among study subjects to yield answers because the lockdown measures had slowed the virus. But now with the resurgence, 
it could shave weeks, if not months, off of the results of the clinical, tri- the phase three clinical trials. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. And and what we are doing is we are optimizing the geographic location of the sites in which we run the clinical trials, where the recruitment of uh, volunteers, as you know, we are on a daily basis, looking at where the epidemiology is taking place, where transmission is happening on a a per zip code basis, and activating clinical trial sites in those areas where transmission is starting to happen. What's important to realize is immunization takes a while. The current vaccines that are being tested uh, are tested uh, after immunizing subjects with two doses of vaccine, a first dose and a second dose, either three or four weeks later. And then you have to wait another one week to two weeks before you're fully immunized. So we start to count the cases for the clinical trial after five to seven weeks or eight weeks after starting to immunize individuals. So what we need is identify sites that are not necessarily at the peak of transmission today, but they are starting to get to to go towards the peak. So that within four, five, six, seven, eight weeks, there will be more cases still coming into that particular site in that particular region. Uh, we can see that you know we need between I'm going to say 70 and 150 cases in the clinical trial to be able to conclude. Okay, now we can look at the trial and did it work or not. We believe that that may happen in a period between six weeks and. 12 weeks from completing recruitment of the trials. That puts these dates somewhere between November and December. So at the very beginning of the COVID pandemic, we were lucky enough to have our colleague Scott Gottlieb, the former head of the FDA on the podcast. And he talked about something you've talked about as well. You mentioned in one of the stories I read that you've never seen something go through phase one to phase four, humans to acceptance in less than four years. But Scott, underscored that the reason for that time is to check on the impact, the adverse impact of any vaccine. How do we get away from those fears that there's going to be some adverse impact that we simply won't have had time to see? Actually, the reasons for that time are not uniquely related to the adverse impact, but I'll comment on the adverse impact in a second. The reason this is going so fast are many. The first one is that over the last 15 years, I would say since actually the SARS-1 outbreak and the MERS outbreak that also happened about 10 years ago, we have learned how to use certain technologies to immunize against respiratory viruses that look like the SARS-2 coronavirus. So we're not starting from scratch wondering what would it take to immunize against this virus. So the discovery process very early on has been very rapid and have benefited from experience from SARS-1, as well as from the development of what's called platform technologies that are similar from one vaccine, can be used for many different vaccines. They they are 90 or 99% the same from one vaccine to the other. Why is that important? It's because for those platform technologies, we know their toxicology requirements. They have been studied already in animals and in clinical trials, and some of them are being used in commercial vaccines, so we have long experience. It's not true for all of them, but for some of them. We know how they behave for manufacturing. I'm going to use an example. It's like if you take a Volkswagen or a Bentley, it's actually the same car underneath. It's the same platform, same kind of engine, same suspension. It's just shinier outside in one case and way more expensive than in the other. To manufacture them, you can use the same manufacturing site. What's happening here is that we have those platform technologies. We used it to do SARS-1 or MERS or Ebola or Zika vaccines. And now we're using them and adapting them to the SARS-2. So we can go much faster from a technical standpoint. We know much more about their behavior in toxicology and animal studies. We know much more about their behavior in clinical trials. We know much more about their behavior on how to scale up manufacturing and be able to make millions of doses. This is the number one reason why we're going much faster. We know much more how to work. And the operation has selected specifically platform technologies for which 
a balance between amount of knowledge of the technology and speed of development was uh, was strong. The second reason why we're going very fast is that we are taking significant financial risk, not safety risk, not efficacy risk, financial risk by running all elements of development of a vaccine in parallel rather than wait sequentially. We're running the preclinical work, so the work in animals, at the same time as we are preparing for the clinical trials. We're running the clinical trials. As soon as we start the first clinical trials, we already are preparing the sites for the phase three trials at risk. At the same time, we're also investing in the manufacturing facilities, in the manufacturing technology, and what's calling scaling up the technologies, so that by the time, frankly, we're starting phase three trial, we're already have refurbished or in, the, in halfway through refurbishing the manufacturing site and uh, techniques that are needed to manufacture. And we will be stockpiling these vaccines from a manufacturing perspective already before completion of the phase three trial. It's a financial risk because those are very expensive processes. But at the same time, what we are able to do is eliminate or, or condense dramatically the lead time between each step and, and running very fast. The key point, the key point is that the FDA will independently review the full data, preclinical, clinical, technical, manufacturing, independently, assess the benefits risk of the vaccines, and independently makes its decision on approval. Now, the one thing that's different is how much follow-up time will we have and uh, after people are immunized. By definition, in this case, right, within four months or six months from immunizing people in the trials, we will have the data from the trial. And because there is such an outbreak and such a pandemic, we may decide who to immunize. And there, we don't know the long-term safety of some of these vaccines. It's true. We have no reason to believe there is anything wrong with them. But for some of them, we simply don't have clinical experience. And there, the key is going to be what's the benefit risk to the population. If you have a risk of acquiring COVID-19 and dying from it, as is the case for individuals who are over 75 and have comorbidities, etc., having a theoretical risk over a period of three years or 10 years that something could happen versus your current risk of having an infection that can be deadly in 15, 20% of those subjects, I think is a very important question that the regulators, but also the CDC will opine upon. Personally, I would take those vaccines because it's a risk now versus a theoretical risk in the long term. Some of the platform technologies we use are going to be available early, and they are not very well known in terms of their long-term safety. So they have the benefit of being here now. Some of the other platforms that we are using are going to be available a few months later, several months later, and we know more how the platform performs with other vaccines. Uh, and I think, again, we in the operation have created a portfolio of vaccines that will allow us to make the best choices for the right subpopulation in terms of benefits. So you could, you could use different vaccines. You have multiple vaccines being developed at the same time. And you could target different vaccines depending on how the clinical trials work at different populations. Exactly. It might In be better for older people, might be better for younger people, might be better for middle-aged or people with certain comorbidities. That's exactly the point. We are testing the vaccines in a diversity of population that is representative of the at-risk populations, all of them. Uh, of course, the aged population, the comorbid population, the various ethnicities in the population, as we know, unfortunately, this has, has higher morbidity and more impact in, in a number of ethnicities and, and socioeconomic status. All of that is being tested in the clinical trials and is going to be done for sure for six vaccines, plus two more that may further be uh, uh, elected into the operations portfolio. And the data will inform us. The science will inform how to best use these vaccines. How effective do you expect the vaccine to be? It's uh, The FDA standard is 50%. You said in an interview recently you thought it could be 90%. 94, I think, is the height of any vaccine with mumps, I think, is uh, very high. Uh, but, you know, what? 
you really think we could have a 90% effective vaccine? Well, let me correct that first, because I was one of the inventors of a vaccine against shingles that is 97.2% oh, okay. good. <laughs> against shingles in individuals, including those who are over 80 years of age. Wow. So vaccines can be very effective, and they, they can be effective over that particular vaccine, without citing its name, uh, is effective over a period of, at least when I retired from GSK, it was over a period of five years, and it was three years mm -hmm. ago. And, and it's probably still the same. What you need to understand, and people need to understand, is when we say a vaccine is 90% effective or 80% or 50%, that's what's called the point estimate. But there is a statistical window around that point estimate that is where the real number is. It could be, let's say, if you say my vaccine is 80% efficacious, and there is a window around that 80% that says it could be 100%, or it could be 60%. That's what's called the confidence interval around the point estimate. When a vaccine achieves, for instance, 90% efficacy, the real number may be 100%, or it may be you know, 70%, or 65%, or 85%. We will know what that interval is. What's very important is I talk about efficacy against moderate disease. Frankly, an ideal vaccine would be a vaccine that's going to eliminate this virus from the face of the earth. I don't think we're going to have that because that would be a vaccine that eliminates any infection. But we already know 80 to 90 percent of people who get infected are asymptomatic. What we may achieve is that I hope 90 percent, maybe more, of people who get infected are either asymptomatic and shed less virus, so they are less infectious, or if they were going to get sick, are not sick. They may have what's called mild disease. They may sneeze for two days. They may shed virus a little bit for a day or a week. But they will not be very sick. They will not have fever. They will not go to the hospital. They will not die. Because that will, frankly, change the impact of this pandemic. And most vaccines actually work that way. And we just don't know whether we got infected or not. You wake up some morning and you say, well, I'm tired today. I had two sneeze. You know, maybe I was cold or I had an allergy and I moved on. It could be an allergy. It could be COVID-19. But now you're not sick out of it. So that's what the 90% is for, not for infection. Infection is going to be lower and less sustainable. So this effort that you're spearheading for the United States, we're seeing this go on in a lot of countries. We're seeing it happen in Europe. There's been a lot of talk of work down at Oxford. Obviously, the Chinese being the epicenter of this coronavirus are also working on it. How much are you all working together and how much are you working in competition? And if you don't mind, let me add a little bit of a tail to that question as well, which is one of the problems that we discovered at the outbreak of that this pandemic was that countries that we relied on for PPE, for example, for personal protective equipment or swabs, wanted to supply themselves before they wanted to supply us. How big a factor is that in some of these issues? So first of all, we only will be able to control this pandemic on a worldwide basis because the world is global. The way this pandemic came like uh, thunder is because the world is global and we are experiencing all the challenges because the world is not global anymore now. So the solution has to be global. And I think there will be many different vaccines developed in many countries. As far as what the operation is looking at, we set ourselves an objective that the vaccine that we will uh, support will be vaccines that are manufactured in the U.S. They don't have to be discovered in the U.S., they don't have to belong to a company that is exclusively based in the U.S. And in fact, as you know, if I take the AstraZeneca Oxford University vaccine, which is one of the vaccines in our portfolio, it's been developed in the U.K. It's been developed by AstraZeneca independently from us in a number of countries. The trials are running in the U.K., in Brazil, in South Africa. But we also took this vaccine and we are developing its manufacturing in a U.S. facility, and we are running phase three trial that should be starting within the next two weeks or so, also here in the U.S., to be able to fully document, according to the FDA highest possible standards, its efficacy and its manufacturability. If I take the Janssen's vaccine, J&J, &J, it's a U.S. company, but its vaccine 
capabilities are based in Europe. Again, it's a vaccine that's being developed for the world, but we are, it took on its development for the US and its first phase three trial will be happening in the US uh, starting um, early in September. If I take the Novavax uh, uh, vaccine, its um, first trials have taken place in Australia and Novavax had an agreement with the CEPI, which is uh, a specific organization that I was involved in the inception of, that is really uh, geared towards helping the, the world and developing countries in particular fight pandemics. CEPI has an agreement with Novavax to develop that vaccine outside of the U.S. We are developing a vaccine for the U.S. So there is a lot of collaboration. There is a lot of data exchange with friendly countries and companies that are you know, seeking to develop vaccines. We have no specific collaboration yet with a Chinese company. It may happen if there was an amazing scientific breakthrough uh, that is coming from there. Uh, we, we should strive to find a solution. Uh, and I think the president had said on May 15 that if we had enough doses of vaccine once, once the need in the U.S. are satisfied, our vaccines can go anywhere in, in the world to help with the pandemic. Um, Dr. Slawi, you mentioned the Chinese. One of the things uh, that I found interesting was that you had spearheaded the opening of a GlaxoSmithKline research facility in Shanghai, which then closed. I, I wonder if, obviously, there's a lot of suspicion in the United States about the way the Chinese government and the way Chinese epidemiologists have handled the virus. Did you have a negative experience then, or was that simply an economic decision? I think it was a mix of both. So in, in 2007 or 2008, uh, I wanted to create more diversity of creativity and discovery of medicines in our GSK, GlaxoSmithKline uh, research activities, as I was heading all the research activity in, in the corporation, and, and looked where patent applications were actually have, you know, being filed in the world. Of course, the majority is in the U.S. and in Western Europe, but there are countries of which China was an important one that are creating a lot of innovation and patents. So we decided to go and create a global discovery center in, in Shanghai and populated it with great scientists that were Chinese scientists trained, and some of them were professors in U.S. universities or European uh, universities partially populated with those uh, scientists, I would say world-class scientists, as well as local scientists from China. The center uh, grew very well uh, and had about 400 scientists. Uh, however, and this is a challenge at some point, the cultural approach to hierarchy in China was such that we found situations where the pressure of the expectation of the leadership of the labs for the experiment to be run and expecting it to be positive that some of the scientists on the bench we couldn't be fully trusting of the data they generate uh, and uh, that was the beginning of the end frankly and we decided uh, ultimately to close also based on economic reasons reasons that had to do with gsk history in, in china which I'm, I'm sure you're aware of we decided to to close that center I would say my personal assessment, there is excellent science happening. However, it's trust and verify and super verify, given the experience. One shouldn't be looking the other way. I think that would be a mistake. Well, that's the perfect segue to my next question. So Pfizer has said they're expecting to have their phase three trials done by October and seek FDA approval. I think Moderna has said November, December, and uh, Dr. Fauci has said it might even be earlier than that, which would put the announcement before the November election. Uh, some have started uh, speculating that there's political pressure here in the U.S. to put out a positive result before November. Uh, first of all, it would be great if we had a vaccine in October, regardless of politics. So could you tell us, A, if that's possible, and B, is there any political pressure on you to get this done before the November election? So the reason I took this role was, A, because I humbly thought I can help this country and the world develop faster vaccines against COVID-19, because this is killing thousands of people here and in the world, and therefore every day counts. The reason has never, ever been, uh, and I am sure I am talking for the thousands of people involved in all the work being done between all the HSS community and the Department of Defense and the other communities and the 
companies that are working incredibly hard. The reason is every day in the U.S., 1,000 or more, unfortunately, people die, and thousands are, are morbid because of this infection. It has nothing to do with the election. That's number one. The engine of this is that. The second, I would say, is the approach is 100% based on facts and data and nothing else. And, you know, we're running clinical trials, going as fast as we can appropriately with vaccine composition that is well thought through, that has shown efficacy in animals, that has shown good phase one studies, that has shown good immunogenicity that is running very, very large trials to document the safety and the efficacy. We're running very large trials because they allow us to reach efficacy faster, not because there's an election, because there's thousands of people dying every day. And the data will be defined by the number of cases. There is no date. It's impossible to give you a date. I have been asked about dates, and I didn't feel any pressure whatsoever to say data will define the date. When we have the number of cases required, and then we have an independent data safety monitoring board independently look into the data and say, we need to continue, we need to stop because this is not working, or we need to stop because this is working too well, it's unethical to continue. We now need to start to give the vaccine to the placebo arm in the trial and to other people to consider. Then that will be the end. So the, the end of the trials is completely independent of the operation or anybody involved in the operation, it's actually great academic experts whose names are unknown to the public who are you know, looking into that data. And this is how all clinical trials are always done. So the data will dictate, the facts will dictate. We may have the end point in October, we may have it in November 4th, who knows? We may have it in December 15th. Uh, you know, that's the answer. And, and uh, to be honest, on a personal basis, I would resign instantly if I was forced to do something that I thought would be inappropriate. That's great to hear. Let me ask you, if I may, and you've been very generous with your time. Thank you for that. I want to ask you a little bit of a personal question, but first I want to tell you what I think so you're not offended by it. There's been criticism of you for your unwillingness to divest certain of your holdings prior to taking on this position at Operation Warp Speed. My view of these things is that if you want the best people, you should not have to force them to bankrupt themselves in order to take on a job that could save hundreds of thousands or millions of lives. But other people have a different perspective. I'd love to hear how you approach this. Yes, I mean, this has been frankly uh, something that really hurts and where I learned the lesson that I'm naive, that politics are more important than ethics and values. I know my values. I know my ethics. I've done things for the last 33 years. I have been fortunate to never have to ask for something because I wanted more money. I always asked for something because I wanted to have impact on people's lives. I obviously had some impact on people's life, which was beneficial to the corporation I was working for, and that uh, allowed me to have a very comfortable financial situation, which, by the way, I have never, I have never acquired shares. I gained shares as part of my income in GSK. I gained shares as part of my income by being on the board of various companies. I realized there is a conflict of interest, and I offered, not was not asked, to divest my Moderna shares. Of course, I should divest my Moderna shares and resign from that board. Of course, I should resign from any board, from any company that has something to do with COVID, and also divest my shares. But on GSK, I'm not on the board, and GSK is my retirement. So what I said is my retirement, and I am not a financial freak. Tell you, I, I am like a, a grand grandfather of financial people. I want to have the dividend paid to me from those shares because it allows me to have a comfortable life and not having to make decisions depending on financial dimensions because that's taken care of through my GSK shares. So, what I said is, I will A, divest everything that is a, a clear conflict, and B, for GSK, I want to 
keep those shares because that's my retirement. However, any accretion in value of those shares between the day I take the role and the day I leave the role, I'm happy to give that value, whatever it is, to fundamental research. So I can tell you, mathematically, it's impossible for me to make any money from this. And frankly, if somebody can demonstrate that some money has been made because I was in this role, I'll be happy at the end to give that money, but not my retirement. Why would I try to help the world and forego my 30 years of work? I, I don't understand it. And why would somebody write that I'm doing this to help my former colleagues enrich themselves? I mean, I find that literally insulting. I don't know these people, and I can tell you something, they don't know me. Here's my message to the people if you do that. I say, I know what I've been doing the last 10 or 11 weeks now. I know what I've been doing 24 hours a day. I'm asking them, what have you been doing? I've been working with a thousand other people to try to accelerate vaccines and therapeutics and diagnostics day and night. And we're going very fast. I don't know whether they will work or not, but if we didn't try, it wouldn't happen. So that's my answer. I'm sorry, it gets emotional around it because it really frustrates me. And it taught me a lesson, which is, frankly, there's a number of publications or newspaper or media that I was hearing and listening to actively before. I'm not trusting them anymore because we told them information that they specifically omitted from the publication. And to me, that crosses a red line on ethics, and I disagree with it. I appreciate your frankness. Thank you for that. We're very blessed as Americans that you're, uh, that you're helping to lead this effort. Uh, exit question. How soon do you think we can go back to normal life? What's the timeline for the average American looking at this effort, hoping that at some point, I mean, we'll never go back to the way we were before perfectly, but when can we, you know, hug our grandparents? When can we, you know, send our kids to school without worrying? When can we go out in the world and not wear masks everywhere? What's your timeline or what's your thought on that? I, I hope we will have enough doses of vaccines in the first two months of 2021 to immunize the at-risk populations in the U.S. Vaccines that would have shown efficacy and approved independently by the FDA. And I'm talking about maybe the 30 to 40 million most susceptible people in the U.S. Uh, across maybe December, January, February. And then... And I think that should decrease dramatically the burden of this disease on society in general, because most, as, as you know, most of the burden of the disease is on a high-risk population, plus the secondary effect of overwhelming the hospital systems, etc., which then impact other, other populations for other reasons. And I think from there on, it's going to be a gradual process. It will be a balance between the benefit risk that the vaccines will have shown and the risk of particular subpopulation. For instance, frankly, immunizing the pediatric population, toddlers, etc., would be something that should be really far because, you know, they have 70 or 80 years to live and we need probably there to use platform technologies that are well understood in the long range, such as protein-based vaccines, etc., and, you know, so I think there will be a gradient of use, but, but probably in the first, between the first quarter and the second quarter of 2021, the most at-risk populations will have been, I hope, immunized and life, I would expect. I hope next summer I can have a vacation, normal vacation. Can I take advantage of you for just 30 seconds and ask a follow-up question? We all want to make sure our parents and our teachers and our populations are first in line. But who's going to be deciding who gets what? You mentioned your shingles vaccine. I still haven't been able to get that because my doctor can't get a dose. So how are you going to manage that distribution and that prioritization? And who's going to make those decisions? And then I'm done, I promise. Super important question. It's a critical question. And... Uh... I can tell you, first, we decided who should not do it. It's very important. And I think this should not be politically motivated. This should be scientifically, ethically, epidemiologically motivated. So the first thing that we thought we should do, which I discussed with the board that oversees the operation and, and then with my colleague Francis Collins, who heads the NIH, was to say, 
we should organize an independent scientific summit that would discuss in concepts outside of having the data with the vaccines, because then, you know, the, the pressure is enormous. But let's discuss just in concept how to best introduce new vaccines, who to immunize first, what kind of performance of vaccine is best suited, to what kind of population, with what we know. Francis suggested that we contact the uh, American Academy of Science and Medicine, which, who is organizing, long story short, this Friday and on an ongoing basis, ethical, epidemiological, virological, vaccinologist discussions around how to best serve the population with all its diversity with a new vaccine or new vaccines against COVID-19. And this summit will create a scientific framework of thoughts that has been generated outside of data, outside of data in the sense of, oh, this vaccine works or that vaccine works, right? No pressure yet, just the science. That framework will, I'm sure, be very useful to inform the very important decisions that the ACIP and the CDC will need to make based on facts and data when we have the performance of the vaccine and also based on the, how, many, how many doses we have. So we, we are acutely aware. We don't think we need to do it in the operation, but we are helping to generate the independent information to inform and, and the science to inform those important decisions. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. My Thank pleasure. you for what you're Thank doing you for, for our country and for the world and, and the sacrifices you're making. And uh, thank you for joining us here today. Danny, first of all, I'm so glad that Dr. Slawi agreed to do this uh, podcast. And I'm so glad that he's leading this effort, despite the fact that people are just like, you know, shamelessly attacking him for no good reason. Here's a here's a man who's not a politician, not, not even a Republican, uh, who's given up uh, time from his life to work 24 hours a day on getting this vaccine to us as soon as possible. And the thanks he gets is people speculating on his ethics. Why would anybody want to join the government and serve their country and serve humanity with that kind of reward? Well, remember what Harry Truman said, and that was, uh, that was more than half a century ago. If you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. That is the ultimate. It was, it was sad to see how disillusioned Dr. Slowey has become because so many people view everything through the prism of politics. But hey, you know, I think we're used to that. I'm just encouraged that, that he had some, what I thought was pretty good news. Uh, right. He seemed very optimistic. He seemed very bullish on the idea we could actually get something by the end of the year. I got to say, I thought we would be out of this by May, which shows you how much I know. So if it's by the end of the year, I know we'll all heave a collective sigh of relief. You know, here's the thing. And this is why I get frustrated with like the anti-mask people. It's like, this is going to end. OK, we're not going to be wearing masks for the rest of our lives. We're not going to have to social distance for the rest of our lives. We're going to get a vaccine. We're going to get a th multiple vaccines. We're going to get therapeutics to treat it. And we're going to be able to go back to our lives. We just need people to take a few selfless steps for a brief period of time to get us over the finish line. And that finish line, as we just heard from Dr. Slowey, it's in sight. You know, if we can, as he said, if we can immunize the most vulnerable people in January, February of next year, we're out of the woods. We're not completely gone. It's not over. We're still going to, it's going to take a little time to, uh, to get everybody protected, but we will have taken care of the vast bulk of the problem and we'll be back, we'll be heading back to normal. And so, you know, just stick it out for a few more months, people. <laughs> we, we can do it. We can do it. Um, you know, we know, we know you out there can do it. If Mark and I can wander around with masks on our faces, as much as we hate this, everybody else can do it too. It really does make a difference. And, and I think that we've seen pretty persuasive science about that. Guys, I wanted to remind you, we are going to be taking off for a couple of weeks. Uh, please listen to old podcasts. Go back and re-listen to your favorites. Send Mark critical emails about all the things he said wrong and uh, brace yourselves because what did Betty Davis say? Uh, was it about the fall election? She said, we're in for a bumpy ride. <laughs> we'll see you guys in September. And our team here at AEI is Alexa Santry, Matt Winesett, Jen Moretta, and Macy Heath. 
let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing us at whatthehell at AEI.org. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at D. Pletka. And I'm at Mark Thiessen. That's Mark with a C. Please rate and review the podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, share it, comment on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.